Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Bill Harris and this is Life Questions. This week's topics certainly reflect a number of current issues and concerns about life. And so we've asked a group of local ministers to review your questions and prayerfully come up with some biblical solutions or biblical insights for you. So here to share their wisdom and knowledge with us today, a great panel. They're back from last week, as a matter of fact. Pastor Alan Sudman of Union Chapel Missionary Church. Pastor Janet Wind of Cornerstone Church. Pastor Rick Lamb of, of Hume United Methodist. And Pastor Mark Bird of Revive Ohio. Thank you very much for being with us again this week. You know, last week I threw a question at you nearly the last minute. We really didn't have time to explore it like we should because of its in-depthness. And that is a question from a viewer that asks, how do you get out of a pattern of sin? Not just sin itself, but when you know, this is a cry for help, wouldn't you say? Yeah. From somebody, how, how do you know how to get out of a pattern of sin? We didn't give you a chance to really uh, reflect on that, Pastor Mark, so I'll let you go first. Well, it's interesting uh, when you talk about that. I'm glad this person is asking, because usually if somebody's asking this question, there's a whole bunch of other people that have the same question on their heart. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad that they're asking. But to pick up where Janet left off last week, actually, she started quoting out of James chapter 4, uh, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Mm -hmm. What's interesting about that, first of all, it, you have to recognize that the temptation to sin comes from Satan, yes. right? It does. And so what, what James is writing here uh, is he's saying that you have to submit yourselves to God. I hear a lot of people quote that and they say, you have to resist the devil. Well, you first have to submit yourselves to God <laughs> yeah. to be able to resist the devil. Mm -hmm. One interesting thing, Bill, in my, in my subtitle here, it says humility cures worldliness. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. what happens here, of course, that's just a subtitle that they came up with, but it's powerful because that is a question that needs to be addressed. But to pick up there, uh, going on to verse 8, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. That's yes. the promise. But the, the thing, the question begs, who takes the first step? Ah, mm -hmm. Drawing near to God and he'll draw near to you. Submit yourself to God, resist the devil. So the, the, the answer to this question, how do you get out of a pattern of sin? Well, you gotta go to God. You have to draw near to him. You have to take the first step, go towards God. He's gonna help you. And then it goes on and says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Man, that's harsh. That's harsh language. But it's but, real. But he's answering that same question here, right? Mm -hmm. And how to do that. And he says, lament and mourn and weep. Mm -hmm. That's what the next verse says. Yes. Yeah. That's what we're to do, right? The humility, that humbling yourself. And we talked about this last week as well. We talked about coming before the Lord and repenting and actually being sorrowful yeah, for our sin, right? Sin. And needing God's power to help us overcome. I think m much of the philosophies in this world does not even recognize, they're blinded to the fact that sin is so powerful and it is so, uh, what I want to say, uh, captivating, mm -hmm. doesn't want to let you go even when you are making efforts to let go, which is why it takes Christ. I mean, you just can't go off of self or human intellect right. to think your way out. That's not enough, doesn't you work. know? So uh, what, what should people be doing here to get out of the pattern? Of, some people don't know they're in a pattern. Yeah. They may be saying, say, I did something wrong today. They, they, they may not understand that there's a pattern there. How, how, do you, how do you deal with a person like that? How do you get them to see it and get them delivered from it? Well, and he mentioned, uh, you know, uh, humbling ourselves and that sort of thing. And we just celebrated Ash Wednesday not long ago. Not every church does that, but it's uh, symbolic of, of being humbled, that we put ashes on our, our forehead to remind us that, you know, in the Psalms it even says that we are but dust and ashes. And, and, uh, and we see several people throughout the scriptures who, who humbled themselves. Uh, Job, for example, when he was going through his trial, he, he put dust and ashes on his head. And, uh, and, and so we see that that's a method by which uh, people can humble themselves. And, and that gives us then the strength because of our humility, God gives us strength then to resist, like you said, resist the devil. 
So and it's important too for people to understand we have we can't do this without God, but right. we can't do it without each other either. Yeah. We need one another. Mm -hmm. God yeah. never intended for us to be an island unto ourselves. Mm -hmm. He said, "You are the body. You are the family. You are, uh, you know, my my whole body can't function with just my foot. My whole, I need all of my body parts, and we are the body of Christ. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, I think surrounding yourself and humbling yourself to say, you know what, I'm struggling here. Yeah. Can you help me? Can yeah. you walk with me? Can you help me? And I think that is a, a powerful uh, help when you're dealing with something." I just think uh, the healing that's in the book of James, uh, it says when you're sick, yeah. tell the elders and then confess your sins one to another. Mm -hmm. Part of the healing is in not only owning it, but sharing it enough that there's somebody to help pull you yes. through. Yeah. And, uh, and last week we talked about confess your sin and renounce it. You, you got to say it to somebody. Yeah. And uh, we just, uh, there's power in the body and there's also mm -hmm. power in weakness saying, you know, I, I'm so thankful when I talked with somebody, those who say, you know, pastor, I'm really a terrible guy. And the other person who says, hey, I'm not so bad. Mm -hmm. The person who's going to get the most help from God is the person who admits, boy, do I need help. Yeah. You know, yeah. and, uh, yeah. Not the Pharisee who goes, well, I'm really better than so-and-so. Yeah. <laughs> that, right you're not at the point you're going to get right. healing yeah. just yeah. yet. So. But how do, how do we reach a point where sin becomes a pattern? Well, and, and you, you make a good point because oftentimes we, we get into a, a cycle that we we sin, it, it was explained to me like a record player. Some of us remember record players mm -hmm. and how there would be a scratch on it and every time it came around to that scratch, uh, you'd hear it and it, it would pop. Itself, yeah. and, <laughs> and it's the same thing with uh, sin, that, that we can go through life, uh, you know, relatively sinless, but then we get to that one point, a point in the month or uh, in the calendar, where we can't resist any longer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and then we give in to the temptations that are before us. And, and, uh, and so we, we can anticipate those and look out for when those times come and get ready for them, uh, get prayed up, have uh, devotions every day and, and uh, do the things necessary to prevent that from overcoming us again. Okay, anybody else? I guess we'll- Bill, I'll say one more thing while we're uh, dissecting the book of James today, which is awesome. So James says in chapter one, verse 14, let each one, but each one is tempted when he's drawn away by yes. his own desires yes. and yes. enticed. Uh -huh. And it says, then when desire has conceived, well, then it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth yeah. death. It's one of my favorite scriptures because it, what, what, what he's saying is first you see it, right. then you do it, then you pay for it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I, I remember a, a, um, a devout Christian psychologist who once said that sin will take you farther than you want to go. It'll keep you longer than you want to stay and it'll charge you more than you want to pay. Amen. It's, 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 it's a vicious cycle. Yeah. Yep. Did you want to continue on? I, I didn't mean to interrupt did. you. You good? Okay. All right. Here's another question we have. Um, uh, it says here, what would be the impact of your life if you married a believer versus marrying a non-believer? I mean, and it's, it's obvious that many, particularly young Christians, have not been taught yet. There's not a discipleship, perhaps, in their church uh, where they're taught that you don't marry a, a non-believer because to do so would really create a, a gross imbalance in that relationship that could lead to divorce and, and, and perhaps a lot of other things. So uh, speak on this matter of that, of that um, unequally yoked situation, would you? So 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Belial, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a rhetorical question yeah, here, yeah. obviously, but 
what Paul's pointing out here is that we are called to be holy. We are called to be uh, doers of the word and not hearers only. And so when you're unequally yoked, it's like two people pulling in different directions Boiling continuously. Water. Yeah, they don't mix. It's like... Mark chapter 3, I believe, Jesus says, a house divided against itself mm. will not stand. Mm. And at first, you may talk yourself into, well, I'm not that much different than they. But the base of our relationship, if it's God and I must obey God, and the other person says, I can do whatever I want, then you're divided. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also think of um, if, if God is bringing together a husband and wife to be one, then you need them. But if their need isn't Jesus and your need is, then that person isn't going to help you mm -hmm. and isn't going to understand you and your basis. And so those two verses kind of together, besides the obvious one of what you read, yeah, is, no, is very clear. <laughs> and then Amos says, how can two walk together except right. they be agreed? There you yeah. go. So how are you gonna walk out life? I can't even imagine, there's so much joy with the things that my husband and I share together, mm -hmm. and I'm sure all of you could say the same thing. When you're sharing the, th he's the Christ is the center of our relationship, yeah. the center of our lives. And I, I mean, marriage is not a cakewalk. Right. So <laughs> I don't even know how people get through certain things when you don't have Christ at the center and he's the one that's leading and guiding everything. But and Daddy, so I much love joy. him. I oh. love him. <laughs> Gary Smalley said that love is a decision. It we is. decide who we love. Yes. And, and so, uh, we, and, and so we have to have that backdrop of God's holy word mm -hmm. that it leads and guides us when we get into relationships. It helps us to understand what am I looking for in a, in a how do I decide who to love? And, and in that way then we can begin to uh, uh, follow our heart after we've made the good decision. Mm -hmm. And God told Israel don't go down and intermarry with the Midianites. Yeah. He said, because you will end up worshiping and serving mm -hmm. their gods, right? right? Yeah. That was the reason. And they didn't listen. And what was the result? <laughs> they so did. Right. Said, right. So. so, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, at that point, it sounds like it's a, it's a good place for a break right now. We've got to pause for just a moment. We are not going away, so don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Don't go away, there's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastors you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. All right, we're back and uh, we're here to answer more of your questions about life. Uh, I, apparently a viewer struggles, uh, Pastor Janet, about um, whether or not the Bible is reliable. How do we know the Bible is reliable, the question asked, both historically and theologically? What would you say to that? Well, it's really the only book that exists that's written uh, over about 40 authors compose it over about a 1500 year time span and it's consistent throughout all of its writings. In addition to that there are so many prophecies that have been spoken and declared in the Bible and uh, over many, many, many years, many of them have already come to pass mm -hmm. and some are still yet to be fulfilled. Um, for example, one of them, Prophet Micah, had prophesied 700 years before the birth of Christ that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Mm -hmm. There's no way that he could have known that or prophesied that. And there's so many other uh, examples like mm -hmm. that. And so there is a, a foundation for a proof. And then Alan had some really uh, good things to say about that as well. Well, let's hear those, Alan. Well, I think there is proof out there. There's plenty of people who have studied all of that. But the second thing is, you got to remember in Christianity, it's by faith. So we trust. Mm -hmm. 
There is proof, but then there's trust. And then the last one is, as we walk through life, we experience him. And uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, a TV broadcaster thought they'd catch Billy Graham off, uh, off his guard, and they said, prove to me right now God exists. And he goes, that's easy. I talked to him just this morning. <laughs> and it's the experience yes. that'll pull you through. And mm. then the scriptures really come alive, and there's no doubt. Mm -hmm. But we just have to trust. Anybody want to add to well, that? Well, I just, I, I was reading in one of the uh, uh, books that deals with archaeological uh, finds. Uh, it's Why Trust the Bible by Rose Pub Publishing uh, from Torrance, California. And, and uh, they pointed out that uh, up until uh, 1949, the oldest... Uh, copy of Isaiah that we had was in Russia and it was about a thousand eight years old okay mm. but then after they f discovered Qumran in the uh, Dead Sea you know that uh, the Bedouin that found it and he um, discovered a, a complete transcript of Isaiah but it was 2,000 years old. Mm. And here's the beauty of it. They found that there was virtually no difference in the two translations. Yeah. Yeah. That God, like you say, there's that aspect. God is in control. And, and the Holy Spirit keeps these things from being corrupted. And, mm -hmm. and there's all these, you know, higher critics and all kinds of people that like to say... No, it can't possibly. Let's do the tele telephone, you know, example. You know, I'll whisper in your ear and we'll go around the room and we'll see if mm -hmm. he has the same answer. It doesn't play like that because the, um, the uh, uh, oral communication of the scriptures was self-authenticating. Grandpa would tell the story and the kids would be there and they'd say, no, Grandpa, that's not how you told it last time. And they would, they would keep correcting, you know, as they went through so that the, the uh, oral transmission of the Bible up until we wrote it down was accurate because they, they, they always corrected one another. Okay. All right. Then um, did you have anything you wanted to ask that? To that, the only thing I would add to that, honestly, is the word itself. And it goes back to what Pastor Allen oh, said. Yeah, and, and you have to have faith because without faith, the scripture itself says it's impossible to please God. And John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God mm -hmm. and the word was God. Yes, yes. Right. And then down in verse 14, and the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. us. So, right. Uh -huh. it, the word itself testifies about itself. Right, and it says in First John that he can't deny himself, right. and so that is the part that you have to embrace by faith. Okay, and and it says that the scriptures are are God breathed, yeah. God breathed, so it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> I mean, it came right out of God's mouth. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Now, here's another question that has come up, uh, totally uh, different. Uh, what is the point of thanking God for things he didn't directly give us? You know, I, I, I don't know. It might be, let's say you get a new job and um, you have the qualifications. You've gone to school. You've got the qualifications and the like. You, and you know somebody that knows somebody to get right. you into that job and the like. And, and, and it, it doesn't appear that God just moved in and gave you that job. Right. What, what is the point of thanking God for things that he didn't directly give us. So James, back to James. Here we are, uh, chapter 1 again, at verse 17. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the bottom line. Again, Scripture answers these types of questions if we will dig in to seek them, right? That's mm -hmm. the answer. So every gift comes from above. Yeah. You can't deny it. And, and he says in the Old Testament that he gives you the power to get wealth, yes. right? God gives everybody the ability yes. to the power to get wealth. And that's um, 
I think that answers this question. Okay. And there's, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say there's several scriptures that also say give thanks in all things and yeah. for yeah. all things. <clears throat> so it tells us you are supposed to be thanking God for everything and as well that all things are working together for your good, even if it's not, you might look at something and go, okay, this wasn't a yep. good situation, mm -hmm. that we can still trust that God is a good, good God, mm -hmm. and he's working all things out for our good, for those uh, who love God and are called. I'm reminded of how uh, at the end of uh, the book of Job, and, uh, and Job uh, seems to have justified himself at that point, and then God breaks through and asks the question, where were you when I created yes. the universe? Where were you when I hung the earth in the, the heavens? Where were you when the sheep were giving birth? Where were you, Job? And, and, and it humbles Job to such a degree that he, he, he begs God's forgiveness and he's just uh, undone, completely undone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we give thanks to everything. It, Job says it in the beginning of his book that, that uh, can we give thanks for the good things that happen and not give thanks for the bad? Yeah. We have to. Yeah. We have to be able to do that. Excellent. Go ahead, Pastor Allen. I was just thinking of two scriptures that talk about how God is in the details of our life. And in Acts uh, 17, it talks about the, even the time period we live in and, and where we live is all placed by God's hand. Then I think of David uh, in the Psalms that says, all of the boundaries have been placed for me in pleasant places. Mm -hmm. And then you tie all that together with the, the phrase that uh, all of our days were ordained. Yes. And all of the things within our yeah. days were ordained before one of them came to be. And so whatever God gives us, it may seem we did it ourselves, but we're a fool to think right. we did it ourselves. Yeah. And, uh, so. Here's an interesting question I thought, how do we become comfortable praying out loud? <laughs> well, to a lot of people that's not a big deal, but apparently to this person, and I'm sure a lot of others, it is. How do we become comfortable praying out loud, I guess in front of a group? You know? Can I start that one? I think the first thing, don't worry about who's listening. Right. <laughs> you got to shut them out and then just breathe in and allow the Holy Spirit to lead you. But now to go back to some real practicalities, I know that sounds real spiritual, but it's really true. You got to be <laughs> spirit led to pray. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the other detail is start short. Ah. You know, God, I thank you for this. And then let other people pray out loud. You don't have to, or when you're so overwhelmed, all you have to pray is God help. Yeah. And he'll hear that. Oh, yes. But why do we have to pray out loud at all? There is strength together. And there are so many places in the scripture that either say watch or pray or cry out. And it's a collective time. Uh -huh. We're not just to pray in a closet. We're to pray in a group. And it's good to pray. But start small and stay simple. Yeah. Nobody has to say we're just Heaven. talking to God. Yeah. yeah. So. And I, I want to go off of what Pastor Allen shared about the question they posed to Billy Graham. Yeah. How do you know God's real? Well, I just talked to him this morning. Mm -hmm. So, Bill, the, the answer to that for me is, well, when you talk to your spouse or your friend or your brother, your relative, do you just talk to them in silence? No, you talk out loud. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so why would you pray out loud? Because you're talking to God. Mm -hmm. And I would just no. add talk out loud even when you're by yourself sure this is this question doesn't mean you know we have to be in a group to start yeah. you might want to start praying out loud while you're still by yourself yeah. Pastor Janet? so many people are though afraid to do something in front of other people and I say do it afraid yeah you know yeah. you just have to do it afraid yeah. I remember when uh, our youth group had to do a service and I got the assignment in junior high school of having to pray out loud in front of the church and so I was a cheerleader and I thought I will lose my voice at that football game on Friday night I will yell and scream and holler and lose my voice so I don't have to pray out loud in front of everybody <laughs> on Sunday morning and I didn't lose my voice Saturday <laughs> I tried to yell some more I didn't lose my voice and on Sunday I just had had to do it afraid mm -hmm. and today I'm a pastor I love yes that. So, yeah. I love that. <laughs> All right. so good. here's a this is one some, somewhat somewhat akin to what we just discussed but 
How do you listen to God in prayer? That's interesting because most people don't like to listen. And I have to be careful all the time that I'm just not there giving God my laundry list of what I want him to do for me today and then getting up and going about my way, you know. But how do we learn to listen to God in prayer? I think it's the key, to be honest with you. I think the key to prayer is not throwing up our words or our requests or God, I need this. But the key to it is listening yes. for the answer. Because how many times do we say, Lord, I need this. And, and we're on the go, so to speak, and we're throwing up our prayers. Mm -hmm. but we don't ever give God a chance to respond. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important part is when God responds. Because God is able to say no. Right. He's able to say not yet. And he's also <laughs> enabled to say yes. Mm -hmm. But unless we're listening, we're not going to know what that answer actually is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the joy of the relationship. It, one one sided relationship. There's no joy in that. The mm -hmm. joy is in the two way communication. You know, he said, be still and know that I am God. He Where'd said, my sheep from? hear mm -hmm. my voice. Where did you get that from? Where did I get? Yeah. Where do you oh, get? Yes, from the Bible. From yeah. the Bible. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes. That we have to memorize scripture so that when God needs to speak to us and tell us something, he can remind us. He can't remind us if we haven't included it in our mind. We have to memorize things so that he can speak to us through his word. And he'll yeah. speak to us even through other things, whether it's oh, yeah. bringing something to our minds. Um, you know, it, it's that inner witness, that mm -hmm. still small voice of the spirit. And I always encourage people, journal, write it yeah. down. Keep a journal with God because God is speaking to you all the time, mm -hmm. but you don't realize it if you're not waiting and being still and listening and writing it down mm -hmm. and realizing mm -hmm. that was God. That Amen. was God showing me that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, similar to what he said in praying the scriptures, say a phrase and then stop and let that phrase speak to you and then, you know, uh, speak it back. But the other thing I guess I want to share that ties in with everybody in about Mark uh, three or four, Jesus calls the disciples, the 12 and they're named. And he says, now I called you for three reasons to be with me, to preach and to cast out the spirits, the, 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 the demons. But notice which one he said first, I called you to be with me. Yes. Number one calling for every Christian isn't so you can ask me what you need, mm -hmm. but be with me. And so part of the motivation mm -hmm. to listen and to go back to another question, why do we need to thank God for those things that seem we, I did myself? Because you'll defeat the devil the moment you start thanking God. Mm -hmm. And so we, one, we have to thank God, but secondly, we have to just be with him. Mm -hmm. uh, the father always loves it when the kid's there, whether he's asking for a yes. candy bar or not. So. Okay, well, and on that note, we'll have to end it. Thank you for being with us today. Certainly hope you've enjoyed our program. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye for now. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us with your thoughts. We're able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.